Our eighth speaker of the evening has worked in a variety of government areas, including health, emergency management, and facility standards. Her most recent role is with Alberta's Climate Change Office. Please put your hands together for Krista Berezowski. All right, I told myself this would be like tap dancing, just practice lots and go with the beat, but it isn't that. <laughs> so, all right, so we're gonna do this. I wanna start by taking us all back in time to a time far away, one that we may have tried to block from our memories, the year 2000. Back then, the world was awash in boy bands, NSYNC had just released No Strings Attached, and we'd all survived Y2K more or less without incident. Back then, this guy was running for president. One of the biggest parts of his platform was a message about climate change and the importance of taking action on it. Al Gore ended up losing to George W. Bush, so that gives us a sense of how that message went over, even though Gore told us that taking action on climate change was already overdue. That's partially because a lot of people didn't take climate change very seriously. Movies like The Day After Tomorrow, where the worst effects of climate change happened in the span of about three days, didn't help public understanding. Globally, climate change action was overdue, and we did almost nothing. And besides, as the decade went on, Albertans had other things to focus on. The world was low on oil, Alberta had some of the world's largest reserves, prices were going up, and so were revenues. Climate change was about as popular an idea in Alberta back then as cheering for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, as a result, the rest of the world probably thought our approach to climate change was something like this. And they may not have been far off. Our priorities at that time were to grow oil production, expand the economy, and take advantage of a boom in commodity prices. So that's what a lot of us did. This largely ignored the growing elephant in the room, which was the distance between the size of Alberta's population and the volume of its emissions. Between 1990 and 2005, Alberta's GHG emissions grew by 40%. And on a per capita basis, we emit three times as many GHGs as the national average. <laughs> it may come as a surprise to you that we weren't unaware of this. Alberta was the first jurisdiction in Canada to put a price on emissions. In 2007, the specified gas emitters regulation came into effect, requiring facilities that emitted 100,000 tons or more of GHGs a year to reduce their emissions. If not, they had to buy credits or pay into a fund. That was an important step forward, but then Alberta kind of took a break. The SGER remained in place, and companies continued to pay into the fund if they couldn't reduce their emissions, but our status as a carbon pricing leader in Canada fell by the wayside when BC became the first province to implement an economy-wide price in 2009. Alberta was being noticed for the impact of its oil sands-oriented economy and the emissions it was contributing to an increasingly stressed global environment. Attacks were launched at pipeline projects that would have carried Canadian oil to market, and for the most part, they worked. Despite being one of the first places in the world to price carbon, we were not seen as an environmental leader. In 2015, government introduced the Alberta Climate Leadership Plan. The plan had four pillars that set goals that seemed ambitious for a place whose economy still depends on fossil fuels. The core of the Climate Leadership Plan is the economy-wide price on carbon. That price began at $20 per tonne in 2017 and rose to $30 per tonne in 2018. It was designed to create a price signal to influence consumer behavior and drive corporate innovation. It was combined with a rebate that over 50% of Alberta households receive. That price was paired for a push for more renewable energy, 30% of Alberta's total supply by 2030. To achieve that, government announced a phase out of the province's biggest contributors, coal-fired electricity plants, by 2030. Those plants are being replaced by wind turbines, solar panels, and other forms of lower emitting electricity. The plan also asked oil and gas facilities to reduce their methane emissions by 45% by 2025 without using bovine backpacks. Instead, by upgrading existing transmission and processing infrastructure, they'll capture methane that would otherwise leak into the air and get more value out of it as a result. Finally, there's a 100 megaton limit on oil sands emissions. 
This is intended to drive innovation in the energy sector, give global trading partners confidence in our commitment to addressing climate change, and open markets to Alberta's oil and gas products. It's a commitment no other oil producing jurisdiction has made, and as the world gets more serious about climate change, it may give us an edge. Innovation is key to the plan and the province is investing in it, from funding emissions reduction Alberta's work to directly supporting large final emitters as they invest in emissions reducing technologies and techniques. This plan gives these ideas the support that they need. The plan gave birth to Energy Efficiency Alberta. We didn't have a program supporting energy efficiency, some of the lowest hanging fruit in the climate world. But now we're harvesting it, and that means solar panels on rooftops, LED bulbs in light sockets, and more efficient appliances in people's homes. In addition, climate leadership dollars support transit, such as and with projects such as LRT projects in Calgary and Edmonton, including $1.53 billion for the Green Line. Better transit means fewer emissions, more transportation options, and better better economic infrastructure, which is a win for everyone. And here's the thing. By taking a position of leadership, Alberta is influencing the path others are taking for climate change. Other provinces are looking at our climate plan. Other jurisdictions around the world are watching what we are doing. And in, rather than playing catch up, we are making these folks chase us. So, like certain members of a former famous boy band, Alberta has come a long way since the turn of the millennium. We've changed, we've matured, and we've grown. Government, industry, and Albertans are making changes that were overdue. And we've taken a path few would have expected of us back in 2000. So in 2018, we all acknowledge that climate is changing. And this is a reality we do have to deal with. We know we need a strategy for climate change, and it's up to everyone, government, industry, and Albertans, to address this issue so that it doesn't become even more overdue. Thank you.